My dear fellow clergymen, while confined here in the Birmingham City Jail, I came across your recent statement calling my present activities unwise and untimely. Seldom do I pause to answer criticism of my work and ideas. If I sought to answer all the criticism that criticisms that cross my desk, my secretaries would have little time for anything other than such correspondence in the course of the day, and I would have no time for constructive work. But since I feel that you are men of genuine goodwill and that your criticisms are sincerely set forth, I want to try to answer your statement in what I hope will be patient and reasonable terms. I think I should indicate why I am here in Birmingham, since you have been influenced by the view which argues against outsiders coming in. I have the honor of serving as president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, an organization operating in every southern state with headquarters in Atlanta, Georgia. We have some 85 affiliated organizations across the South, and one of them is the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights. Frequently, we share staff, educational and financial resources with our affiliates. Several months ago, the affiliate here in Birmingham asked us to be on call to engage in a nonviolent direct action program if such were deemed necessary. We readily consented, and when the hour came, we lived up to our promise. So I, along with several members of my staff, am here because I was invited here. I am here because I have organizational ties here. But more basically, I'm in Birmingham because injustice is here. Just as the prophets of the 8th century B.C. left their villages and carried their thus saith the Lord, far beyond the boundaries of their hometowns, and just as the Apostle Paul left his village of Tarsus and carried the gospel of Jesus Christ to the far corners of the Greco-Roman world, so am I compelled to carry the gospel of freedom beyond my own hometown. Like Paul, I must constantly respond to the Macedonian call for aid. Moreover, I am cognizant of the interrelatedness of all communities and states. I cannot sit idly by in Atlanta and not be concerned about what happens in Birmingham. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. You deplore the demonstrations taking place in Birmingham, but your statement, I am sorry to say, fails to express a similar concern for the conditions that brought about the demonstrations. I am sure that none of you would want to rest content with a superficial kind of social analysis that deals merely with effects and does not grapple with underlying causes. It is unfortunate that demonstrations are taking place in Birmingham, but it is even more unfortunate that the city's white power structure left the Negro community with no alternative. In any nonviolent campaign, there are four basic steps. Collection of the facts to determine whether injustices exist, negotiation, self-purification, and direct action. We have gone through all these steps in Birmingham. There can be no gain saying the fact that racial injustice engulfs this community. 
Birmingham is probably the most thoroughly segregated city in the United States. Its ugly record of brutality is widely known. Negroes have experienced grossly unjust treatment in the court. There have been more unsolved bombings of Negro homes and churches in Birmingham than in any other city in the nation. These are the hard, brutal facts of the case. On the basis of these conditions, Negro leaders sought to negotiate with the city fathers, but the latter consistently refused to engage in good faith negotiation. Then last September came the opportunity to talk with leaders of Birmingham's economic community. In the course of the negotiations, certain promises were made by the merchants, for example, to remove the store's humiliating racial signs. On the basis of these promises, the Reverend Fred Shuttleworth and the leaders of the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights agreed to a moratorium on all demonstrations. As the weeks and months went by, we realized that we were the victims of a broken promise. A few signs briefly removed returned. The others remained. As in so many past experiences, our hopes had been blasted and the shadow of deep disappointment settled upon us. We had no alternative except to prepare for direct action whereby we would present our very bodies as a means of laying our case before the conscience of the local and the national community. Mindful of the difficulties involved, we decided to undertake a process of self-purification. We began a series of workshops on nonviolence, and we repeatedly asked ourselves, are you able to accept blows without retaliating? Are you able to endure the ordeal of jail? We decided to schedule our direct action program for the Easter season, realizing that except for Christmas, this is the main shopping period of the year. Knowing that his strong economic withdrawal program would be the byproduct of direct action, we felt that this would be the best time to bring pressure to bear on the merchants for the needed change. Then it occurred to us that Birmingham's mayoral election was coming up in March, and we speedily decided to postpone action until after the election day, when we discovered that the Commissioner of Public Safety, Eugene Bull Connor, had piled up enough votes to be in the runoff, we decided again to postpone action until the day after the runoff so that the demonstrations could not be used to cloud the issues. Like many others, we waited to see Mr. Connor defeated, and to this end we endured postponement after postponement. Having aided in this community need, we felt that our direct action program could be delayed no longer. You may well ask, why direct action? Why sit-ins, marches, and so forth? Isn't negotiation a better path? You're quite right in calling for negotiation. Indeed, this is the very purpose of direct action. Nonviolent direct action seeks to create such a crisis and foster such a tension that a community which has constantly refused to negotiate is forced to confront the issue. It seeks so to dramatize the issue that it can no longer be ignored. My citing the creation of tension as part of the work of the nonviolent resistor may sound rather shocking, but I must confess 
that I am not afraid of the word tension. I have earnestly opposed violent tension, but that is a type of constructive non-violent tension which is necessary for growth. Just as Socrates felt that it was necessary to create a tension in the mind so that individuals could rise from the bondage of myths and have truths to the unfettered realm of creative analysis and objective appraisal, so must we see the need for nonviolent gadflies to create the kind of tension in society that will help men rise from the dark depths of prejudice and racism to the majestic heights of understanding and brotherhood. The purpose of our direct action program is to create a situation so crisis-packed that it will inevitably open the door to negotiation. <clears throat> I therefore concur with you in your call for negotiation. Too long has our beloved Southland been bogged down in a tragic effort to live in monologue rather than dialogue. My friends, I must say to you that we have not made a single gain in civil rights without determined legal and nonviolent pressure. Lamentably, it is an historical fact that privileged groups seldom give up their privileges voluntarily. Individuals may see the moral light and voluntarily get, give up their unjust posture. But as Reinhold Niebuhr has reminded us, groups tend to be more immoral than individuals. We know through painful experience that freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. Frankly, I have yet to engage in a direct action campaign that was well-timed in the view of those who have not suffered unduly from the disease of segregation. For years now I have heard the word wait. It rings in the ear of every Negro with piercing familiarity. This wait has almost always meant never. We must come to see with one of our distinguished jurists that justice too long delayed is justice denied. We have waited for more than 340 years for our constitutional and God-given rights. The nations of Asia and Africa are moving with jet-like speed toward gaining political independence, but we still creep at horse and buggy pace toward gaining a cup of coffee at a lunch counter. Perhaps it is easy for those who have never felt the sting dots of segregation to say, wait. But when you have seen vicious mobs lynch your mothers and fathers at will and drown your sisters and brothers at whim, when you have seen hate-filled policemen curse kick and even kill your black brothers and sisters when you see the vast majority of your 20 million Negro brothers smothering in an airtight cage of poverty in the midst of an affluent society, when you suddenly find your tongue twisted and your speech stammering as you seek to explain to your six-year-old daughter why she can't go to the public amusement park that has just been advertised on television and see tears welling up in her eyes when she is told that Fun Town is closed to colored children and see ominous clouds of inferiority beginning to form in her little mental sky and see her beginning to start, distort her personality by developing an unconscious bitterness toward white people when you have to concoct an answer for a five-year-old son who is asking, Daddy, why do white people 
treat colored people so mean when you take a cross-country drive and find it necessary to sleep night after night in the uncomfortable corners of your automobile because no motel will accept you when you are humiliated day in and day out by nagging signs reading white and colored and your first name becomes nigger your middle name becomes boy however old you are and your last name becomes john and your wife and mother are never given the respected title mrs when you are hired by day and haunted by night by the fact that you are a negro living constantly at tiptoe stands never quite knowing what to expect next and are plagued with inner fears and outer resentments when you are forever fighting a degrading and degenerating sense of nobodiness then you will understand why we find it difficult to wait there comes a time when the cup of endurance runs over and men are no longer willing to be plunged into the abyss of despair. I hope, sirs, you can understand our legitimate and unavoidable impatience. You express a great deal of anxiety over our willingness to break laws. This is certainly a legitimate concern. Since we so diligently urge people to obey the Supreme Court's decision of 1954, outlawing segregation in the public schools, at first glance, it may seem rather paradoxical for us consciously to break laws. One may well ask, how can you advocate breaking some laws and obeying others? The answer lies in the fact that there are two types of laws, just and unjust. I would be the first to advocate obeying just laws. One has not only a legal but a moral responsibility to obey just laws. Conversely, one has a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. I would agree with St. Augustine that an unjust law is no law at all. Now, what is the difference between the two? How does one determine whether the law is just or unjust? A just law is a man-made code that squares with the moral law or the law of God. An unjust law is a code that is out of harmony with the moral law. To put it in the terms of St. Thomas Aquinas, an unjust law is a human law that is not rooted in eternal and natural law. Any law that uplifts human personality is just. Any law that degrades human personality is unjust. All segregation statues are unjust because segregation distorts the soul and damages the personality. It gives the segregator a false sense of superiority and the segregated a false sense of inferiority. Segregation, to use the terminology of the Jewish philosopher Martin Buber, substitutes an I-it relationship for an I-thou relationship and ends up relegating persons to the status of things. Hence, segregation is not only politically economically and sociologically unsound, it is morally wrong and sinful. Paul Tillich has said that sin is separation, is not segregation an existential expression of man's tragic separation, his awful estrangement, his terrible sinfulness. Thus, it is that I can urge men to obey the 1954 decision of the Supreme Court, for it is morally right, and I can urge them to disobey segregation ordinances, 
for they are morally wrong. Let us consider the more concrete expression of just and unjust laws. An unjust law is a code that a numerical, a power majority group compels a minority group to obey, but does not make binding on itself. This is difference made legal. But the, by the same token, a just law is a code that a majority compels a minority to follow, and that is, it is willing to follow itself. This is sameness made legal. Let me give another explanation. A law is unjust if it is inflicted on a minority that as a result of being denied the right to vote had no part in enacting or devising the law. Who can say that the legislature of Alabama which set up that state segregation laws was democratically elected? Throughout Alabama, all sorts of devious methods are used to prevent Negroes from becoming registered voters. And there are some counties in which even though Negroes constitute a majority of the population, not a single Negro is registered. Can any law enacted under such circumstances be considered democratically structured? Sometimes a law is just on its face and unjust in its application. I hope you are able to see the distinction I am trying to point out. In no sense do I advocate evading or defying the law as would the rabid segregationists. That would lead to anarchy. One who breaks an unjust law must do so openly, lovingly, and with a willingness to accept the penalty. I submit that an individual who breaks a law that conscience tells him is unjust and who willingly accepts the penalty of imprisonment in order to arouse the conscience of the community over its injustice is in reality expressing the highest respect for law. Of course, that is nothing new about this kind of civil disobedience. It was evident sublimely in the refusal, refusal of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to obey the laws of Nebuchadnezzar on the ground that a higher moral law was at stake. It was practiced superbly by the early Christians who were willing to face hungry lions and the excruciating pain of chopping blocks rather than submit to certain unjust laws of the Roman Empire. To a degree, academic freedom is a reality today because Socrates practiced civil disobedience. In our own nation, the Boston Tea Party represented a massive act of civil disobedience. We should never forget that everything Adolf Hitler did in Germany was legal, and everything the Hungarian freedom fighters did in Hungary was illegal. It was illegal to aid and comfort a Jew in Hitler's Germany. Even so, I am sure that had I lived in Germany at the time, I would have aided and comforted my Jewish brothers. If today I lived in a communist country where certain principles dear to the Christian faith are suppressed, I would openly advocate disobeying that country's anti-religious laws. I must make two honest confessions to you, my Christian and Jewish brothers. First, I must, must confess that over the past few years, I have been gravely disappointed with the white moderate. I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in his stride toward freedom is not the white citizen's counselor or the Ku Klux Klaner 
but the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice, who constantly says, I agree with you in the goal you seek, but I cannot agree with your methods of direct action, who paternalistically believes he can set the timetable for another man's freedom, who lives by a mythical concept of time, and who constantly advises a Negro to wait for a more convenient season. Shall our understanding from people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright rejection. I had hoped that the white moderate would understand that law and order exist for the purpose of establishing justice and that when they fail in this purpose, they become the dangerously structured dams that block the flow to social progress. I had hoped that white moderates would understand that the present tension in the South is a necessary phase of the transition from an obnoxious negative peace in which the Negro passively accepted his unjust plight to a substantive and positive peace in which all men will respect the dignity and worth of human personality. Actually, we who engage in nonviolent direct action are not the creators of tension. We merely bring to the surface the hidden tension that is already alive. We bring it out in the open where it can be seen and dealt with like a boil that can never be cured so long as it is covered up but must be open with all its ugliness to the natural medicines of air and light. Injustice must be exposed with all the tension its exposure creates to the light of human conscience and the air of national opinion before it can be cured. In your statement, you assert that our actions, even though peaceful, must be condemned because they precipitate violence. But is this a logical assertion? Isn't this like condemning a robbed man because his possession of money precipitated the evil act of robbery? Isn't this like condemning Socrates because his unswerving commitment to truth and his philosophical inquiries precipitated the act by the misguided populace in which they made him drink hemlock? Isn't this like condemning Jesus because his unique God consciousness and never ceasing devotion to God's will precipitated the evil act of crucifixion? We must come to see that as the federal courts have consistently affirmed, it is wrong to urge an individual to cease his efforts to gain his basic constitutional rights because the quest may precipitate violence. Society must protect the robbed and punish the robber. I had also hoped that the white moderate would reject the myth concerning time in relation to the struggle for freedom. More and more, I feel that the people of ill will have used time much more effectively than have the people of goodwill. We will have to repent in this generation, not merely for the hateful words and actions of the bad people, but for the appalling silence of the good people. Human progress never rolls in on the wheels of inevitability. It comes through the tireless efforts of men willing to be co-workers with God. And without this hard work, time itself becomes an ally of the forces of social stagnation. 
we must use time creatively in the knowledge that the time is always ripe to do right. Now is the time to make real the promise of democracy and transform our pending national elegy into a creative psalm of brotherhood. Now is the time to lift our national policy from the quicksand of racial injustice to the solid rock of human dignity. You speak of our activity in Birmingham as extreme. At first I was rather disappointed that fellow clergymen would see my nonviolent efforts as though and it comes perilously. One is a force of complacency made up in part of Negroes who as a result of long years of oppression are so drained of self-respect and a sense of somebodiness that they have adjusted to segregation and in part of a few middle-class Negroes who because of a degree of academic and economic security and because in some ways they profit by segregation have become insensitive to the problems of the masses. The other force is one of bitterness and hatred and it comes perilously close to advocating violence. It is expressed in the various black nationalist groups that are springing up across the nation, nourished by the Negroes' frustration over the continued existence of racial discrimination. This movement is made up of people who have lost faith in America, who have absolutely repudiated Christianity, and who have concluded that the white man is an incorrigible devil. I have tried to stand between these two forces, saying that we need emulate neither the do-nothingism of the complacent, nor the hatred and despair of the black nationalists. For that is a more excellent way of love and nonviolent protest. I am grateful to God that through the influence of the Negro Church, the way of nonviolence became an integral part of our struggle. If this philosophy had not emerged, by now the hatred and despair of the black nationalists. For that is a more excellent way of love and nonviolent protest. I am grateful to God that through the influence of the Negro Church, the way of nonviolence became an integral part of our struggle. If this philosophy had not emerged, by now many streets of the South would, I am convinced, be flowing with blood. And I am further convinced that if our white brothers dismiss as rabble-rousers and outside agitators those of us who employ nonviolent direct action, and if they refuse to support our nonviolent efforts, millions of Negroes will, out of frustration and despair, seek solace and security in black nationalist ideologies, a development that would ev inevitably lead to a frightening racial nightmare. Oppressed people cannot remain depressed forever. The yearning for freedom eventually manifests itself, and that is what has happened to the American Negro. Something within has reminded him of his birthright of freedom, and something without has reminded him that it can be gained. Consciously, unconscious, consciously, he has been caught up by the spirit of the times, and with his black brothers of Africa and his brown and yellow brothers of Asia, South America and the Caribbean, the United States Negro is moving with a sense of great urgency toward the promised land of racial justice. If one recognizes this vital urge that has engulfed the Negro community, one should readily understand why public demonstrations are taking place. The Negro has many pent-up resentments and latent frustrations, and he must release them. So let him march. Let him make prayer pilgrimages to the city hall. Let him go on freedom rides and try to understand why he must do so. If his repressed emotions are not released in nonviolent ways, 
They will seek expression through violence. This is not a threat, but a fact of history. So I have not said to my people, get rid of your discontent. Rather, I have tried to say that this normal and healthy discontent can be channeled into the creative outlet of nonviolent direct action. And now this approach is being termed extremist. But though I was initially disappointed at being categorized as an extremist, as I continued to think about the matter, I gradually gained a measure of satisfaction from the label. Was not Jesus an extremist for love? Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Was not Amos an extremist for justice? Let justice roll down like waters, and righteousness like a mighty stream. Was not Paul an extremist for the Christian gospel? I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. Was not Martin Luther an extremist? Here I stand, I cannot do otherwise, so help me God. Was not John Bunyan an extremist? I will stay in jail to the end of my days before I make a butchery of my conscience. And Abraham Lincoln, this nation cannot survive half slave and half free. And Thomas Jefferson, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. So the question is not whether we will be extremists, but what kind of extremists we will be. Will we be extremists for hate or for love? Will we be extremists for the preservation of injustice or for the extension of justice? In that dramatic scene on Calvary's Hill, three men were crucified. We must never forget that all three were crucified for the same crime, the crime of extremism. Two were extremists for immorality and thus fell below that environment. The other, Jesus Christ, was an extremist for love, truth and goodness, and thereby rose above his environment. Perhaps the South, the nation and the world are in dire need of creative extremists. I had hoped that the white moderate would see this need. Perhaps I was too optimistic. Perhaps I expected too much. I suppose I should have realized that few members of the oppressor race can understand the deep groans and passionate yearnings of the oppressed race and still fewer have the vision to see that injustice must be rooted out by strong, persistent, and determined action. Let me take note of my other major disappointment. I have been so greatly disappointed with the white church and its leadership. Of course, there are some notable exceptions, and I am not unmindful of these. But despite these notable exceptions, I must honestly reiterate that I have been disappointed with the church. I do not say this as one of those negative critics who can always find something wrong with the church. I say this as a minister of the gospel who loves the church, who was nurtured in its bosom, who has been sustained by its spiritual blessings, and who will remain true to it as long as the cords of life shall lengthen. When I was suddenly catapulted into the leadership of the bus protest in Montgomery, Alabama a few years ago, I felt we would be supported by the white church. But this never came through. All too many ministers found themselves more cautious than courageous and remained silent behind the safe security of stained glass windows. In spite of my shattered dreams, I came to Birmingham with the hope that the white religious leadership of this community would see the justice of our cause and with deep moral concern would serve as a channel through which our just grievances could reach the power structure. I had hoped that each of you would understand, stand, but again I have been disappointed. 
I've heard numerous southern, southern religious leaders admonish their worshipers to comply with a desegregation decision because it is the law. But I have longed to hear white ministers declare, follow this decree because integration is morally right and because the Negro is your brother. In the midst of blatant injustices inflicted upon the Negro, I have watched white churchmen stand on the sideline and mouth pious irrelevances and sanctimonious trivialities. In the midst of a mighty struggle to rid our nation of racial and economic injustice, I have heard many ministers say those are social issues with which the gospel has no concern. I have traveled the length and breadth of Alabama, Mississippi, and all the other southern states on sweltering summer days and crisp autumn mornings. I have looked at the South's beautiful churches with their lofty spires pointing heavenward. I have beheld the impressive outlines of a massive religious education buildings. Over and over I have found myself asking, what kind of people worship here? Who is their God? Where were their voices when the lips of Governor Barnett drip with words of interposition and nullification? Where were they when Governor Wallace gave a clarion call for defiance and hatred? Where were their voices of support when bruised and weary Negro men and women decided to rise from the dark dungeons of complacency to the bright hills of creative protest? Yes, these questions are still in my mind. In deep disappointment, I have wept over the laxity of the church, but be assured that my tears have been tears of love. There can be no disappointment where there is not deep love. Yes, I love the church. How could I do otherwise? I am in the rather unique position of being the son, the grandson, and the great-grandson of preachers. Yes, I see the church as the body of Christ, but oh, how we have blemished and scarred that body through social neglect and through fear of being nonconformists. There was a time when the church was very powerful, and the time when the early Christians rejoiced at being deemed worthy to suffer for what they believe. In those days, the church was not merely a thermometer that recorded the ideas and principles of popular opinion. It was a thermostat that transformed the mores of society. Whenever the early Christians entered a town, the people in power became disturbed and immediately sought to convict the Christians for being disturbers of the peace and outside agitators. But the Christians pressed on in the conviction that they were a colony of heaven called by God to obey God rather than man, small in number. They were big in commitment. They were too God intoxicated to be astronomically intimidated. Things are different now. So often the contemporary church is a weak, ineffectual voice with an uncertain sound. But the judgment of God is upon the church as never before. If today's church does not recapture the sacrificial spirit of the early church, it will lose its authentic ring and forfeit the loyalty of millions and be dismissed as an irrelevant social club with no meaning for the 20th century. Perhaps I have once again been too optimistic. Is organized religion too inextricably bound to the status quo to save our nation and world? Perhaps I must turn my faith to the inner spiritual church, the church within the church, as the true ecclesia and the hope of the world. But again, I am thankful to God that some noble souls from the ranks of organized religion have broken loose from the paralyzing chains of conformity and joined us as active partners in the struggle for freedom. They have left their secure congregations and walked the streets of Albany, Georgia with us. They have gone down the highways of the South on torturous 
rides for freedom. Yes, they have gone to jail with us. Some have been dismissed from their churches, have lost the support of their bishops and fellow ministers, but they have acted in the faith that right defeated is stronger than evil triumphant. And their witness has been the spiritual salt that has preserved the true meaning of the gospel in these troubled times. They have carved a tunnel of hope through the dark mountain of despair. I hope the church as a whole will meet the challenge of this decisive hour. But even if the church does not come to the aid of justice, I have no despair about the future. I have no fear about the outcome of our struggle in Birmingham. Even if our motives are at present misunderstood, we will reach the goal of freedom in Birmingham and all over the nation because the goal of America is freedom. Abused and scorned though we may be, our destiny is tied up with America's destiny. Before the pilgrims landed at Plymouth, we were here. Before the pen of Jefferson etched the majestic words of the Declaration of Independence across the pages of history, we were here. For more than two centuries, our forebears labored in this country without wages. They made cotton king. They built the homes of their masters while suffering gross injustice and shameful humiliation. And yet out of a bottomless vitality, they continue to thrive and develop. If the inexpressible cruelties of slavery could not stop us, the opposition we now face will surely fail. We will win our freedom because the sacred heritage of our nation and the eternal will of the Almighty God are embodied in our echoing demands. Never before have I written so long a letter I'm afraid it is much too long to take your precious time. I can assure you that it would have been much shorter if I had been writing from a comfortable desk. But what else can one do when he is alone in a narrow jail cell other than write long letters, think long thoughts, and pray long prayers? If I have said anything in this letter that overstates the truth and indicates an unreasonable impatience, I beg you to forgive me if I've said anything that understates the truth and indicates my having a patience that allows me to settle for anything less than brotherhood. I beg God to forgive me. I hope this letter finds you strong in the faith. I also hope that circumstances will soon make it possible for me to meet each of you, not as an integrationist or as a civil rights leader, but as a fellow clergyman and a Christian brother, let us all hope that the dark clouds of racial prejudice will soon pass away and the deep fog of misunderstanding will be lifted from our fear-drenched communities and in some not too distant tomorrow, the radiant stars of love and brotherhood will shine over our great nation with all their scintillating beauty. Yours for the cause of peace and brotherhood, Martin Luther King, Jr.